Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to my true crime podcast. Today is December the 6th. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and yes, I have had my coffee. Before we get started, I want to thank all of you who have taken the trouble and the time to like the video, to subscribe. Liking the video helps to have other people see it. And so, you know, it's an algorithm thing. Uh, so I do thank those of you who have done that. If you've not uh, liked the video, do so now, because I may forget or I may not forget, and I may just ask you to do it again later. You know, I'm going to have as much information as I can on this podcast. Um, oh, there's so much to uh, tell you about. There's so much that has happened. You know, I tweeted earlier this morning that um, when the Franklin child abuse scandal broke in 1988 basically the machine that's run by the intel services shut it down right and so if you go to wikipedia and you look for the franklin child abuse scandal what you're going to see is that it's going to say it's a hoax well we know it wasn't a hoax right uh and then we fast forward to 2019 and we hear about the Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell child trafficking ring, except that it's making it itself kind of like known through mainstream media sources. And um, so, it, you know, initially I believed that the reason it had traction on the mainstream media circuit, and I'm gonna, you know, I don't know what else to call it, you know, traditional media, whatever it is. Um, obviously, you know that it's an arm of the intelligence. And so when I saw that it had legs and it was moving and it was, everybody was talking about it and it basically became the true crime story of the century. And then we had Alexander Acosta, who Trump had appointed as his. Uh, when you know he 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 selected him, I believe it was in 2017. He selected Alex Acosta, who had been responsible for giving Jeffrey Epstein a very lenient sentence back in 2005, 2006, 2007. Gave him a non-prosecution agreement. Basically, gave him a stay out of jail card because Epstein only went to j day jail. Right? He had a chauffeur driven car taking him to an office that he rented that he you know named for some scientific research project and so um when acosta came out and said you know i was told to back off that he meaning epstein belonged to intelligence some mainstream media sources basically took that quote and then those of us Somebody like myself, who has been trying to find answers for why a powerful person or powerful people above him or alongside of him have wanted me dead, you know, but for those of you who do not know who I am, I am a sex slave survivor to one of these billionaire predatory men, okay? One of the men who control the world. And this man is connected to Robert Maxwell. He's connected to the Mossad. He is connected to the CIA. In fact, so connected to the CIA that the United States in the 1960s or the 1970s, when Nixon wanted uh, designs for Apollo 11 for the astronauts, for the moon landing it was the Rickless's one of their subsidiaries playtex who was given the plum assignment of designing the spacesuits that were worn by neil armstrong and buzz aldrin um and so 
uh, you know, I stopped because just the thought of the the fact that basically Rickless, just for, and I, I'm not going to bore you too much with this information, but Rickless, just like Leslie Wexner, in fact, they were school chums uh, at Ohio State University and know each other and, uh, and you know, are basically the, uh, um, how I'm going to call them cutouts for two intelligence agencies that work as sister companies. And hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Um, they both put out garbage merchandise, you know, their clothing, let's say for uh, Michelle and Rickless, who owned a ton of clothing stores, uh, and Leslie Wexner, who also had a ton of clothing stores, their merchandise was inferior. So the, the when I knew that the United States government had given the contract to Michelle and Rickless's uh, Playtex. I was just stunned, and and then of course I discovered other things during the course of the time that I was a sex slave for eight years. Um, so we we've had some interesting developments. Um, we've had the fact that yeah, the Epstein story became public, but what happens on mainstream media is that it is localized. So they're only going to talk about the Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell case. And in fact, even journalists like Julie Brown have begun to step away from what Alex Acosta said. I read an article, literally, and I'm trying to find it so that I can link it and give you access to it, where she said, oh, Alex Acosta didn't really mean that. Oh, suddenly, and you know, I have a lot of respect for Julie Brown, and I'm sorry that she's facing a lot of hardship and all of that stuff because she did manage to get this a lot of attention. Um, and so we have to give credit where credit is due. However, for her to suddenly say that's really not what he meant, and then we have somebody like Adam Davidson who tweeted several months ago, and he has since removed it, that they looked to see if there were any signs of truth in the fact that Epstein was part of intelligence, but they found none. Okay, well, so that we see that mainstream is pushing away from the narrative, but they've also isolated the Epstein-Maxwell ring from the others that came before it. I happen to know that they're all connected. A lot of you who have listened to me and to read my work and who have been following the information that I've shared with you for close to four years now, it'll be four years in six months. So three and a half years. Um, and in fact, some of you know me from even before I started to tweet about the Epstein case. So you know about this for a very long time. They're all interconnected. All of these rings didn't begin with Jeffrey Epstein. They didn't just, you know, they, they're, they're interconnected and interwoven. And like I say in almost every podcast, I look at it like a tree with a lot of branches. Um, so the way that mainstream has, and, and even some independent journalists, who have been talking about the Epstein story. If you isolate it from being connected to another trafficking ring, gee, it looks the same. It has the same players. In some cases, it has exactly the same players, not, not even the same position, right? So that maybe the attorney general was the same, maybe a certain judge was the same, maybe a certain congressman was the same, maybe a certain president was also involved or a certain vice president was involved. But, you know, so it's not even like they they, they don't make any mention. And the, the other thing that they don't make any mention of, frankly, is that they both, the Franklin and the Epstein case, both are MK Ultra cases. We know this from various sources. We know, for example, 
when Paul Benash, but I mean, I think his name is Benacci or Benassi. When, when Paul Benacci of the Franklin child abuse case gave his testimony in a lawsuit where he was, he basically won a million dollars. He's not never collected a penny of that, but he won a million dollars against King, uh, Larry King, not to be confused with Larry King of CNN, who has now, you know, long since retired, but Larry King, who owned a savings and loan. And really, I'm going to be doing a whole uh, Epstein project article on how the savings and loan scandal of the 1980s and the 1990s is interconnected with child trafficking and nobody has sort of even looked into that and you know and i become completely incensed uh when i see the negligence or the cover-up so the reason that to get back to why the epstein case suddenly had legs <sighs> I discovered, I mean, like, you know, I knew that David Boys was involved. I was taken aback. I was surprised. But I had not really understood initially in 2019 the full grasp of what it meant to have David Boys involved. I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to go really deep into boys in this podcast because I have too much to share with you, but I'll just say, go back, read Ronan Farrow's Army of Spies. It's ex accessible through the New Yorker magazine. You can find it online. And basically, boys was not only the attorney for Harvey Weinstein, he was the attorney for the Clintons. He was the attorney, as I exposed in one of my articles in my Substack. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I have two different newsletters. I have the Epstein Project newsletter now in its fourth year. And then I have my Substack. And it's a little over two months. And I've got a lot of articles in there. And in one of those articles, I show that uh, David Boyes was also Leslie Wexner's attorney. And he was an attorney for another one of the um, men who were close to Jeffrey Epstein, who was in his black book, who went to the island. So David Boyce has been basically the attorney for a lot of the men who Virginia Dufre outed. Now, one of the tweets that I found, because I was having some some issues with my computers and I need to have more than one computer because the interference I get and the pushback I get is intense. It has nothing to do with memory or anything like that is, has been suggested on my timeline. Um, but Virginia Dufre tweeted in 2021 when she heard that Kamala Harris was going to meet with Bill Clinton about you know women's issues uh, you know and she was she tweeted something and it, it, like you know how can you do that he was at the island 26 27 times blah 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 and it you know that's kind of when i realized even virginia didn't know that boys to was connected to the the very people she had seen the very people and sarah ransom who many of you are aware is another victim of Jeffrey Epstein and Galen Maxwell, and who was um, sort of like around the same time, a victim during the same time period that Virginia was. Um, she literally um, decided that they lied to her and she put in a complaint, a grievance complaint, because she had already signed and accepted an agreement. And so she filed a grievance complaint, basically saying that David Boyce had not been um, sort of, you know, uh, he had not told her, he hadn't explained things to her. So here's the thing. I covered the trial, Glenn Maxwell's trial, and I basically told you guys that it was controlled 
And it was not a lot of stuff came out in that trial. The same thing with the Epstein case. The reason it got legs is because the information that was released and primarily the only information that's been released has been through David Boyes, J. Stanley Pottinger and Bradley Edwards. That's the information that's been released. And it's a controlled, it's a controlled situation, right? None of the cases went to court, so there could be no more discovery. Prince Andrew, as you know, Virginia said that she was going to take him to court, that it, she was not interested in the money. And as it turns out, we were all disappointed when Virginia settled with Prince Andrew. Now, um, I write all the time about how the intelligence agencies work in suppressing information. And quite frankly, I kind of had, when I was doing my work regarding the Franklin scandal, for example, and I came across the fact that the attorney for the victims was in fact a friend of Colby's, William Colby, who was the director of the CIA and who had also been part of the Phoenix program. I realized that there had been some control, let's call it controlled opposition. It was just a controlled situation. It's like, okay, if you have one of your own handling a case, well, you can just make sure that this information doesn't get out and this doesn't get out. And that's pretty much the only reason that the Epstein case received any traction whatsoever, which is more than we've gotten before, but it's still controlled by the intelligence agencies. So now here's, here's what happened. I wanna talk a, a little bit about Rachel Chandler and the Balenciaga situation, but not in the way that um, other people are doing it. Um, when I first wrote Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, I included a chapter on Chelsea Handler's background. I, I went back into her history, I think, what, three years ago? And, and you know, discovered who her great-grandfather was, where their money came from, what other scandals they were connected to. And I, I, I had a, a, a chapter included in Jeffrey Epstein, Predator Spy, which I removed. Now, I removed it for a lot of reasons, um, but anyone who mentioned Rachel Chandler's name on Twitter would get suspended. And so somebody, a few people got suspended even now after the Balenciaga scandal. And if you're not um, familiar with that, uh, Balenciaga just had a, a, a very, um, a big scandal regarding one of their newest ads featuring literally toddlers wearing s &M outfits. And um, that, you know, it was like, that was really bad, but then it was discovered that, oh, wait a minute, Rachel Chandler is connected to this. And so for those of you who do not know, Rachel Chandler was one of the um, associates, uh, you know, she, she, she had been with Epstein and also connected to Nexium. In fact, on her Instagram, and it's in, you know, I may just repost this somewhere on one of my newsletters. On her Instagram, which is no longer, you know, she's gone back and she's done a lot of deleting and stuff like that. She had uh, mentioned that the woman who was part of like the second in command of the Nexium uh, scandal was her mother. And so I will be um, Nancy Saltzman 
she called her mom. And I have that information. So there were some images on her Instagram when she didn't know any of us were looking. And they were very, very disconcerting. There were images of like two little three-year-old girls, uh, one holding a knife, wearing a hoodie. And with a, you know, over a pentagram. So it was sort of like a sacrificial photograph. She had a lot of photographs that some of you have probably seen of children who looked like they were abused. And her agency, it's, she's supposed to be a photographer with an agency called Midland. And so it, it was then discovered, oh, well, she's connected to the Balenciaga ad. Well, there's another woman that you guys should keep, sort of keep tabs on. And that would be um, Lota Volkova. That's L-O-T-T-A. The And that, that's her first name, L-O-T-T-A. And her last name, Volkova. That's V as in Victor, O-L-K-O-V-A. Now, if you look at her Instagram account, and I tweeted a little bit about this earlier today, you'll see similar images of um, just a lot of blood and gore. And uh, she was also involved with Balenciaga. Here's the thing, the fashion industry and Hollywood, they are different tentacles of the same animal that controlled Jeffrey Epstein. It's all interconnected. So I just want to give you a historical uh, look-see at who Rachel Chandler is. Uh, so all of you have seen her photograph uh, taken with former President Bill Clinton in, nine, in 2006, where she is standing in, inside Ron Burkle's airplane uh, with Bill Clinton and his arm is around her. Um, Ron Burkle is a supermarket mogul and he has, you know, private planes similar to Jeffrey Epstein. He's also connected to Epstein. He's connected to Steven Mnuchin. Everyone in positions of power, they're interconnected. So I just want to go back to one thing I have emphasized over and over and over again, and I'm going to keep saying it until everyone gets this. Mainstream media has made it seem that only poor, disadvantaged girls just young girls, minors from poor neighborhoods were the ones who were targeted and became part of Jeffrey Epstein's trafficking ring. That is not true. I have always told you that it included not only people from economically uh, different uh, classes, but that some of those girls were fine. And in fact, they said they were fine. You know, some of those girls said, you know, my parents were together. We were a happy family. We weren't poor. I, you know, I was an honor student. And then we can take that a step further. Um, there are even mainstream media accounts of when Ghislaine Maxwell walked into a club and she spotted Paris Hilton, and she told the person that she was with, oh, I want her for Jeffrey Epstein. I want her for Jeffrey. And and so, like, there's, we, we have this um, connection to women from a higher level of society, like Rachel Chandler. She's a socialite. All right. And there are many others and I write about them all the time because 
mainstream media doesn't do it. So I write about them. So this is, and the reason we have these, this overlapping of rich, poor, rich, poor, rich, poor, and mainstream is not talking about it is because this is, it's embedded into our society so that these women, they do graduate up. Those who come into it having, let's say, no money, but just having the looks and they marry well, right? Or we have the intergenerational, the multi-generational women like Chandler who are part of the structure already. And because it's it's it controls every aspect of our lives, you know, the Hollywood side, the fashion side, they're basically, you know, what we we're 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 it's like a matrix. I mean, I don't even know how else to describe it. So Chandler's name became synonymous with child sacrifice and satanic ab abuse. Um she's uploaded and she was just really uploading and she didn't care a lot of horrific photographs um and the people started to call her i think uh they called her um they called her ray chandler the child handler uh but she's a socialite and um she's an heir to the chandler newspaper fortune the chandler newspaper fortune goes back generations and so I, I just want to remind you of a quote. Uh, Bill Casey, William Casey, who was Ronald Reagan's uh, director of the CIA. In 1981, he said, we'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. And so that's kind of sort of true. That's basically what's happened. So the Chandlers have been in the publishing industry uh, far longer than the Maxwell family ever was. And they had much more power in the United States than Robert Maxwell ever had in the United Kingdom. In 1882, General Harrison Gray Otis, the family patriarch, paid $5,000 for a stake in the Los Angeles Times. Eight months after the four page publication began. So the Los Angeles Times began as a four page publication. Otis was described as just being a really nasty kind of guy. You know, he was rude. He was a Civil War colonel. He kept an arsenal of shotguns in the newsroom in case. Listen to this. In the event that there was trouble, like that his people wanted to go on strike or there was a problem, he just had these guns, an arsenal of shotguns to make sure that his newspaper was not interfered with. Now, listen to this. He was born in Ohio. Ohio. Ohio keeps coming up as the birthplace of a lot of these um, shady characters that we're beginning to see. He visited Los Angeles in 1874 when it was still farmland. And so basically it only had chickens and stray dogs. That's all he saw, but he saw a piece of open land and that's kind of what he said, you know, this is for me, a lot of land for very, very little money. Um, sexual blackmail in the Otis Chandler family predates Rachel's connection to Epstein. So five generations before Rachel was even born, Otis controlled politicians, not only with his temper, not only with his newspaper, that he used as a source, like, you know, like uh, sort of like the way that newspapers put down the Epstein victims in Palm Beach, calling them all kinds of names and they were just children. So he did that. But he also um, 
had a way of using blackmail, sexual blackmail, to make sure that the politicians who he wanted to put into office were elected. So, and um, and I don't know how many people know ab about this. Um, he would sabotage the candidacy of a political candidate that he disliked, and he would accuse them of taking part in an orgy. And so when the candidate would turn around and say, what are you talking about? You're lying. He would produce photographs. So all, and then he would put it in the newspaper, whether it was true or not. So all of this blackmail stuff, this goes back generations. And Rachel Chandler is a product of this, which is inbred into her. Okay. So this horrific stuff that most people are seeing for the first time, this is not new. So he went on to acquire large plots of land. And it was this really deadly combination of media and property that turned him into the most powerful family, not just in Los Angeles, but within the United States. So everything that happened in the city of Los Angeles happened because of the Chandler family. Um, and I'm going to try to tell you as much as I can about her background because nobody else has done it. So you're here. Let's do it. One of the more uh, brutal battles that he fought was against organized labor. He didn't want unions. He didn't believe in them. He, he wanted to work his people to the bone, get the most like, you know, slave labor. So, again, you know, that's back in, in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. and working class people were to be used as slaves. Here we are, right? It's 2022. And the conversation has suddenly turned into, oh, they're trying to divide us. They're going to be the, you know, they're the elite and we're the slave labor. It's always been like that. It's been like that for a long, long time. You just haven't noticed. But we're, we're at least the conversation started and now more people are noticing. So it turned basically his battle against organized labor turned him into the biggest villain uh, for the national, national, not local, but national labor movement. And so it, it, it made him uh, someone that people wanted to retaliate against. So on September the 30th, 1910, James Mac McNamara, a trade unionist, set a suitcase packed with a detonator and 16 sticks of dynamite in an alley next to the building where Otis Chandler had his newspaper building. It exploded. It destroyed the building. It killed 21 people and injured many more people. And it was actually, that was the first terrorist attack on US soil. And it was rep it would be later replicated by others. But imagine the 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 building exploding with dynamite, not just killing the people, but destroying the building. It does that sound familiar? That was the one of the first things. It comes from Rachel Chandler's family background. All right. So in 1887, Otis hired. 23-year-old Harry Chandler as the newspaper circulation clerk. In 1894, Harry married Otis's daughter, Marion. And there, that's where the name Chandler connects with Otis's um, family. And we get into the Chandlers. Um, but he was even more ferocious than Otis in his quest for domination. And, and it was also he who took the um, Chandler family into the highest levels of power, wealth, and scandal. I mean, if you if you look at him and I have a photo and I hope hopefully I can upload it somewhere and maybe I'll use it as a cover photo, I don't know, for this podcast. Um, 
he was a normal looking guy, uh, sort of pudgy, a little bit like um, Prince Andrew is today, a little pudgy, but, you know, he wore a suit. Uh, he had the typical glasses that, you know, glasses similar to the type that um, that were used by uh, Casey of the CIA and uh, wore his hair short. Um, and But he was a monster. He built his empire by partnering with bankers and businessmen and buying even more land. And so through the newspaper, he pitched Southern California as a paradise. He's the reason that people moved from the East Coast to leave the harsh winters behind. And, he, and in order to accomplish this, he needed two things. He wanted to make um, the Los Angeles area like the place that people would come to but remember it was barren you know it was just it was just dirt dirt land there's just again literally chickens and a couple of horses and dirt roads and and so what he needed in order to accomplish his goal were people and water he needed water in order to get the people to come so he began to uh, champion a 233 mile aqueduct that would transport the Sierra snow from the you know where where the snow melts in the Sierra to melt and and be sort of uh, travel to Los Angeles. And so in 1904, the population was approximately of Los Angeles was approximately 200,000. The farmers were offered bargain prices for their land before word of the aqueduct was made public. So the farmers who didn't have access to water and who were farming and living off the land were basically paid pennies on the dollar for their land. Does it sound familiar? Yeah, it sounds exactly like what Leslie Wexner did when he built his town in Ohio. He had people go out, pay the farmers pennies on the dollar. The people, the farmers there did not know that a billionaire was the one responsible in buying up this land. And that's how they do it. You know, they, they use front people to do that. And so it displaced a lot of the families. And then the, the, the uh, land became the Chandler's property. And so this story that I just told you about the land and the water, there's a very famous movie that was made out of this. And I'm sure not one of you will be able to tell me what the name of that movie is, but I'm going to tell you right now, Chinatown, starring Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway in the film, the 1994 film, Chinatown, is the movie that shows the story of this wealthy power broker who owned the police and everyone around them. And it has, in the movie Chinatown, if you remember, it has the story, the Faye Dunaway story. She is the prominent businessman's daughter, but also a victim of incest. And she has a child. Her child is her father's, not just grandchild, but it's her father's child. And so we have, this is a true story from the Chandler family. Okay, but you won't find it anywhere. You will po possibly find the Chinatown starring Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway. You might find that that it's based on the Chandler family. You might find that, but I I know 100% you're never going to find the story about the incest, the child incest of having a child with your own teenage daughter. Pre pre legal age even okay, 
Uh, so by 1929, I'm sorry, by 1923, Chandler and his friends were busy encouraging the film industry. So the reason we have Hollywood is because Chandler and his friends courted these men to come here. We're going to give you land. And what he did was they invested, he and some of his friends, Chandler, they invested only $21,000. And of course, you know, we have to know that $21,000 at the time was a lot of money, but that is the price for the 45 foot high letters that read Hollywood land, because it didn't just read Hollywood. The whole sign was Hollywood land. It was, um, it would, there were like light bulbs in it. Um, they were all like, they had four, 4,020 watt light bulbs flashing holly and then it flashed wood and then it flashed land and then the whole word and then it repeated it continuously and so he basically once the properties were sold and the movie directors were busy making their film he ignored the sign, that's why it went into disrepair, because he didn't want to spend any more money. He had already accomplished his mission, and the sign uh, disintegrated, and then we lost the word land, and somebody else later came and fixed it. Um, so that is pretty much the original Hollywood land is, again, comes from Rachel Chandler's history. So Chandler also helped to establish the aerospace industry by helping to finance Donald Douglas in 1920, who arrived in Los Angeles with an order from the Navy for tor torpedo planes. The Douglas aircraft would be responsible for the creation of the area's post-war middle class. And so before he handed the reins of his publishing empire to his son named Norman, he also had a hand in the creation of the Coliseum, the Hollywood Bowl, Caltech, the Biltmore, and the Ambassador Hotels, all right? Santa Anita Park and Trans World Airlines, TWA. I mean, you'll find that a lot of these companies, TWA, a lot of this stuff, remained relevant. Again, this is from Rachel Chandler's family. Okay, Harry and his wife, Marion, had eight children. Norman basically followed in his footsteps. So in 1944, when Harry Chandler died, he became the third generation to publish the newspaper. Norman attended Hollywood High, and then he went to Stanford University although he dropped out in his senior year. He was a, a frequent visitor to where? You're gonna love this, Bohemian Grove. He was one of the original Bohemian Grove private San Francisco-based gentlemen's club, which every year held a mysterious two-week event for the most powerful men in the world. And so, I have to tell you, I mean, the history of the Chandler family, I'm just so surprised that nobody has really done a deep, a deep um, dive, but I've got some more for you. Here's the thing. A lot of different people are, have, have written about the black, the black Dahlia, but uh, there was a, a man Black Dahlia Elizabeth Short, I think many of you know who she is or was. A man by the name of Daniel Wolf wrote a book. It was called The Mob, the Mogul, and the Murder that Transfixed Los Angeles. Elizabeth Short was 
a 23 year old aspiring model actress. She was very beautiful. And uh, she was last seen at the Biltmore Hotel. The Biltmore Hotel belonged to the Chandler family. So the, the hotel staff recalled seeing her use the telephone in the lobby. But on the morning of January 15, 1947, her naked body was found severed in two pieces. It was a horrible scene. And most of you have seen the photos of what how she was found. She was severed at the waist. Her body was drained of blood. It left her skin a very pale white. Her face had been slashed in a joker smile from the corners of her mouth to her ears. The murderer had taken the time to wash her body. There were cuts on her thigh and her breasts, and there were portions of her flesh sliced off. I want to stop here, and I want to remind you that in my um, Substack newsletter, in The Devil is in the Details, I include information about the slicing of skin in the Jeffrey Epstein ring that no one is talking about. So that article, if you haven't read it, is the devil is in the details. And um, this is not a new thing. The Black Dahlia provides clues, clues as to even in, into what goes on in the Jeffrey Epstein thing even into how I began this program by talking a little bit about the Balenciaga ads and these children. Um, so when, I'm gonna just continue. So there were portions of her flesh sliced off and the murderer positioned her body with the upper torso one foot higher than the lower, placing her inter internal organs under her rear, and then he had her pose with her hands over her head, her elbows bent at right angles, and her legs spread apart. Over 150 suspects were questioned, but no one was arrested. Well, in the book by Daniel Wolf called The Mob, the Mogul, and the Murder that Transfixed Los Angeles, he says that one of the men who was suspected of being the murderer was Norman, Norman Chandler. He says that by he, Wolf, the author of the book, claims that Chandler had gotten Elizabeth Short pregnant when she was working as a call girl for a famous Hollywood madam named Brenda Allen. Allen was the original Hollywood madam Later, the moniker would be given to Heidi Fleiss. But before Heidi Fleiss, there was Brenda Allen, who was known as the Hollywood Madam. And so what we can remember also is that one of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein later bragged about being like Heidi Fleiss. And Heidi Fleiss, for those of you who don't know, she's connected to the Epstein case they knew Epstein knew who Heidi Fleiss, they knew Heidi and Heidi is connected to intelligence. And how do I know this? Oh, I think I'll share that with you at another time. All right. So the book suggests that Chandler hired Bugsy Siegel to murder short. So this is the only book that says who possibly could have done this to the Black Dahlia, that's how we remember her, to Elizabeth Short. I know some other people have come out and said, my father killed uh, Elizabeth Short. But a suspect, unbeknownst to, I guess, most of the world, was Rachel Chandler's, I think, grandfather. Uh, so the Los Angeles County District Attorney's file state that Elizabeth Short was not a prostitute, and was not pregnant when she was murdered. Um, let's see if there's something I have not given you. Oh, okay. So on Rachel Chandler's Instagram, 
Uh, and I'm trying to see if there's a date on this. And yeah, I think I have a date. So on October of 2014, Rachel Chandler put up a, an old photograph of Nancy Saltzman, who co-founded the Nexium sex slave cult, along with celebrities and several socialites, as you know. And she wrote mom with a heart. And then some people, lady were like, oh, you know, it, they started to comment. And of course it's long since gone, but I have a photograph. And again, no one's connected. And it gets, I, I'm gonna swing right back to the way I started this podcast. So that Nexium is connected to the Epstein uh, trafficking ring, which is connected to the Franklin ring, which is connected to the Presidio case, which is connected. These are all interconnected. Um, but you're not gonna get that from mainstream media. I know I'm probably gonna have a lot of questions and I will answer them as I can. Uh, but please, if you have not liked the video, like the video to support my work, consider becoming a patron on my Patreon and my newsletters, you know where to find them. I'll leave links below. Uh, like the video, like the video, subscribe. Um, I hope that you've gotten some information that's useful into understanding who Rachel Chandler is, and I will continue to be uh, working as hard as I can, which is what I do, right, um, to bring you the information really that mainstream isn't giving you and that even indie journalists aren't bringing to the table, although there are some that do spectacular work and um, everyone who works hard to bring the right information to you should be commended. All right, with that, I'm going to wish you guys a really nice day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.